Okay, we're recording. And the All time right. is set for 5.03. All right, wonderful. Thank you. We'll call the meeting to order 5.03 p.m. Uh, item A, Zoom meeting information, success. Move on to item B. Uh, Chair Seth, I am here. Vice Chair Ned. Present. Alder Andy. I am here. John. Present. And it doesn't look like we have Stephanie. Uh, Corey. Present. Julia. Here. And you said Cody is excused. <clears throat> and Mark. Here. All right. On to approval of the agenda. So moved. Motion by Randy. Is there a second? Second. By Mark. All those in favor of approving the agenda for today's meeting, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, approved. On to minutes from last meeting. I move to approve the minutes. Move to approve. Alder Andy, is there a second? Second. By John. All those in favor of approving the minutes from last meeting, say aye. 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 Wonderful. All those opposed? That carries. All right. On to regular business. Uh, discussion with possible action regarding um, sustainable landscape and land use at East River uh, slash Emily Street Park. Uh, brought forward by Ned. Um, Ned or um, Melissa, would you like to speak to that to start? Um, this was brought up in the last meeting and we tabled it or held it over for this meeting. Um, I don't have a lot to say at this point other than um, for the land use part of it. Um, Ned, I don't know if you were referring to the dog park suggestion or just the sustainable landscaping conversion to potential pollinator habitat and maybe better adapted plants for that area of the East River Parkway. Sure, I can speak to that. I think it'd probably be best to separate that the dog park discussion and, and to direct that directly to the parks and work with Alder Galvin on, on that um, question. So really this one is about sustainable land use over there at the uh, park on really both sides of the East River as it flows through um, the Aster East River area into the Joannes area, that, that area that is um, uh, flooded pretty regularly and um, mostly landscaped in lawn grass. Uh, as we've seen over the last few years, um, a lot of that lawn has died off. It's been flooded over and over again. And there are pretty vast swaths of land that are um, muddy and brown and, and dead. And um, it is, um, I think, kind of a, if we're the group that sent forward the water resolution to respect our local waters. And I think part of that is paying attention to how our local waters behave um, and not trying to fight those, those waters. Um, there are plants that we could be putting in place um, on those large dead areas that would have more flood tolerance. Um, and, and certainly I know Melissa, you, you had said, um, if I would like some screen sharing, I can show you some of the pictures I've taken and then um, talk sure. about some of those resources for flood tolerant plants. I think you can go ahead and share your screen. You should um, have permissions. Looks like I'm still uh, not able to do so. There we go. All right, thank you. So I'll go, um, I, I have several pictures. I'll just show you a couple of what I'm talking about. Um, one, there are a lot of areas on the, um, both sides of the river down, down in that neck of the woods um, that are 
huge brown spots basically um and and it is due to a lot of the flooding over the last few years pretty regular flooding um around this is the grass so this picture i took a little bit probably a month ago um so it is greener down there now but these large areas keep dying off and um if you get up closer to some of them you'll see there's even some standing water um in those areas and um some canada geese nesting as well um and these are in like the athletic fields so um i think one solution in both aesthetically addressing it and environmentally addressing it is to look at what some some recommendations are for wet prairie planting in the area um, grasses and wildflowers that are tolerant and um, i found some resources from the michigan dnr and then also from the wisconsin uh, dnr that i think would be useful if we were to kind of delve into this um, i wouldn't suggest us picking plants tonight i think that would be something that would be better handled uh, with the discussion with staff members but i do uh, believe that we can recommend to move away from lawn grass in some of those over flooded areas and put in some native pollinator friendly drought and and flood tolerant plants um, along the, the east river um, I was asked actually before this meeting by a member of the media if this was to address flooding in the neighborhood and i just want to make it clear that it is not to address flooding in the neighborhood on any kind of a grand scale um, certainly it could be used as you know an example of here's what you can do at home you can put in some some rain gardens and things like that um, for for minor flood water mitigation but really this is not a goal of mine right here uh, to completely get rid of all the flooding in the East River. This is just to address some of those spots on the parks alongside the East River. So I can stop um, sharing that. And uh, I remember actually, I saw Randy's item about no mow and it kind of ties in my item here ties into the discussion last year we had about no mow may. Um, after we talked about that, I talked with Director Grenier for quite a while, and um, we kind of came to a conclusion of let's look for land that the city owns that would be kind of ripe for some of these native perennials. And to my mind, um, we have quite an opportunity down along the East River to replace some of the lawn grass that keeps dying off with some of these Wisconsin native perennials. So. And I, as a staff person, I think it's a great segue when we get to that point, and I, I'm in support of that as well. Thank well, you. Thank you, Ned. Uh, Julia, uh, you have your hand up. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to, I'm going to put it in the chat, so just so folks are aware that that um, in partnership with uh, Bay Lake Regional Planning Commission did an East River floodplain study and looked for areas to improve habitat already. And so the link I just put in there is specifically one of the action plans or I'm sorry, recommendations specifically for this area in Green Bay. I'm Corey, I'm surprised they didn't work with your uh, parks on this actually when they were doing it. Um, but it has basically the recommendations already Ned for what you're looking for anyway. So it's already teed up to be a project area that you could apply for a grant and do restoration in this area for. And they like even identified the types of habitat types that you would be planting like to that area. And so it would be um, in terms of flooding, what you can say though, is it's um, protecting the floodplain and like, so not developing it. And it's a really important piece of um, not developing in the floodplain, therefore it, it, it does have a flood benefit, flood protection benefit. Um, and then the, it would be to, their project was to enhance fish and wildlife habitat, but also uh, pr uh, protect and enhance public land and park access too. Thank you, Julie, could I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. um, 
So I remember you actually, you and I talked about this, the idea of planting along the East River maybe a year or two ago. And I think you had mentioned that doing a large scale planting in that neighborhood, either on the Van Beaver side or um, on the Astor side, wouldn't necessarily um, be kind of a one and done project to control flooding in that area. Does that sound familiar to you? Yes, so what, your, your question. Would you, okay, so is the recommendation that you shared with us more about flood control or is it something else? that i it's exactly kind of what you it's what you said this is a really great uh, opportunity to improve like fish and wildlife habitat and restore wetland floodplains right now it's turf grass mm -hmm. um, you're likely not going to do development but it is in terms of it's in the floodplain so which means you can count it towards being um, an action to increase flood resiliency but oh, yes, wonderful. it's not going to solve the problems that exist there because it's there's more there's houses in the floodplain that are beyond this the park area. Mm -hmm. But um, it is a flood benefit because you're protecting and restoring the floodplain. Wonderful, wonderful. Does that make sense? That does. You know, I, I don't want to. I guess based on the conversation that you and I had, whenever that was, um, I don't want to give anyone kind of the false hope that putting a bunch of plants in the park is going to solve our flood problems along the East River in that part of town. So I just want to be mindful about how uh, we would communicate that recommendation. That is, that is correct. I think, again, your message that is really accurate, though, in um, we want to promote restoration of the floodplain and other areas, too, like nat mm -hmm. and naturalizing it also. Um, so it's it's not gonna, and it is, it's protecting flood storage. Okay. And yeah, it's like, I, it's an important asset that that is an area that is allowed to flood. Right, right. Would you recommend, um, I guess, based on what I talked about on those patches, those are mostly uh, that I took the pictures of on the, on the west side of the river. Would you recommend um, a different, maybe motion or um, I don't I guess, I guess what I'm thinking is it's not just I guess I would just encourage it as a there's a lot of people in this area outside of city staff that are interested in doing a restoration project like this and to you know have city staff work and leverage that those opportunities in terms of grant so like the city could work with the nature conservancy to secure a grant and then do the restoration kind of things you know basically, like, or something like that. So I guess my point is, it's not all just left up to city staff. Like there's a lot of people and partners around uh, in this area who would want to collaborate on a project like this. And the, the worst the site has been done, okay. this conversation has already been started. So it's like a great opportunity to say from like us, yeah, let's, let's move forward and make this happen. Awesome. Yeah, that's really good news. Alder, Andy, you got your hand up. Um, Just saying hi. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering then, would it, a motion be, and would it go to parks or would it go for Melissa, for staff to work on a grant uh, with, to apply to get the, a grant and work with these groups to restore uh, as much of the East River uh, that uh, has been studied and, and looked at and planned for? Would that be, which, which way would it go? Which would be better, Parks or Melissa, do you think? Well, we could keep it general um, because it is a park area. It's a park, you know, it's a designated park area. It would likely be um, park staff, but that doesn't mean that I wouldn't be involved necessarily. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I don't know if we need to, um, direct this at this point to the 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 parks commission or the parks you know that that committee that deals specifically with that Corey do you have any thoughts she's frozen in thought oh she just says she has a poor internet connection 
So I guess my I recommendation. Oh. Oh, yes, yes, we can. All right. Okay, my internet. I'm not sure if you're hearing me. I'm trying to call in. Maybe Tra could we have her type what she wanted to? Um, Great. Corey, if you can, if you can hear us, try turning your video off, just using your audio. You gotta unmute your audio. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, I, it keeps freezing up on me, so hopefully this will help maybe now. Sounds like, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. A lot better. Great. Um, I don't know. It sounded like you're maybe looking for input or I'm not sure. Sorry, I missed the a question, the, the question is, is, you know, as far as emotion, how to refer this, does it just refer to staff? Um, does it go specifically to park staff? And then, you know, using some inner, you know, interdepartmental collaboration with outside agencies, or does it need to go to a, a um, does the sustainability commission now need to refer it to a standing committee, which is kind of what I'm thinking it needs to go to. A standing committee, like within the sustainability commission, you mean, or, or no, like a standing a committee, committee is there? Yeah. Yes. The parks committee. That's what I'm wondering if it needs to go to. Um, I guess I like the idea of referring it to staff. We are, in, you know, to do this type of initiative, so to speak. Um, we are like currently looking at the possibility. Oh, it looks like I'm free. Oh, okay, I think I'm back, maybe. Yep, yep, we can hear you now. Sorry, we're back? Okay. <laughs> um, we are exploring other areas of the city right now, like um, potentially acquiring some property. Am, am I, is this working? <laughs> You're in yeah. and out. Okay. Um, maybe I should try calling in again or maybe refer to park staff and we can go from there if you're comfortable with that. Okay. I, I just have one question for Julia. Uh, do you know what all was studied? Was it all in what were the city parks purview or was it at land outside? Um, it looks like, I think they just looked at the opportunities along the, I don't know, you have to read the beginning of it. Um, I, they, I think they looked at public, private, public, properties along the East River to try to figure out where there was opportunities for, for yeah. restoration. So it's more than Green Bay, but uh, but their recommendations are all based on municipal recommendations. So that leads me to think if they looked at public property. Um, I would like to add like just this area though is having been down there and understanding the flooding in this area, I feel like this this goes a little bit beyond just restoring like wetlands down there and the neighborhood itself could really do from like a master plan of redevelopment like whether it's like the home buyouts along with improving public access and open space in that area and like what that even looks like in that area just around flooding so like the the, like the restoration stuff is like an immediate thing you could do probably right away because you have the land but does it fit within like a broader how can we make this area more resilient? Not really, which would could take would take a little bit more of a focused planning process. So with the community, because then you could find out like what that community wanted in that area, whether it's like amenities and stuff. But I don't, just a thought, you know, it goes beyond just restoration of to me in this area. If you're gonna start doing stuff, why not have like a more of a master plan for the neighborhood in general? I think there was, that was started, I think, back when there was flooding. I don't know. I mean, I wasn't involved in that. It wasn't my area, right? I don't know. Maybe we check with uh, Elder Galvin and uh, see where all, but I thought there was a, a plan afoot to, to address that. I don't know where they are or who's doing it even or what. Public works? I'm not sure. Well, it's all part of, you know, what 
part of this position, my position is for flood resiliency, not just in that neighborhood, but you know, throughout the city for flood resiliency, whether it's coastal flooding um, or other areas. So um, I would say, yes, it's being looked at. Um, and, you know, do we have a, a master plan specifically for that neighborhood? No, there's not a master plan at this point. No, yeah, and I and I just meant to say that that's like a great that's another great project. You know what I mean? That could be mm -hmm. teed up for a grant that would include you know restoration and potentially increase the open space there. Um, but like low hanging fruit, you could get a grant probably pretty easily to do the wetland plants and restoration in that area, just as is. Maybe think about public access though, like boardwalks and stuff. You know. Mm -hmm. So the, the resource, sorry, I just want to say the resource Julia shared is is um, it's great for that east side of the river. Um, so I think we'd still have to look at what we could do along the west side. Uh, the pictures I took are from the west side of the river where that Emily Park is and East Lawn and Optimist. Um, looks like they focus pretty heavily on the Van Beaver north and south. If I'm not missing something which isn't bad at all. I think both sides need to be attended to. Uh, just wanted to point that out. It's a cool, it's a great resource. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, Sorry. I think I'm back. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Yeah, real good now. Okay, great. Um, so yes, I mean, we actually were involved with some of that planning with the that link that um, Julia shared and with the Nature Conservancy and, and um, going through that process, the Parks Department was. Um, we've also been, the Parks Department has been working with other municipalities to explore the flooding along the East River Trail um, to see if or what should be done about the areas of the trail that get flooded. And if we kind of want to work on that as a collaborative effort or really kind of permit municipality. So we're definitely exploring that right now. Um, one of the things we're taking into consideration with that then is along with that, do we have to plan for stormwater management? And if so, what does that look like? And where would that happen? And, you know, as part of the engineering to go along with getting um, the areas of trail out of the flooding, flooded areas. Um, so it's definitely discussions we're currently having. Um, I think too, Parks is definitely open to in general and throughout the city, reach of like underutilized turf or flooded turf or, you know, that don't um, really serve the city well. Um, I think probably two of our biggest struggles with making, you know, the reduction of turf grass is really budget to implement um, the new plantings, but also to maintain them. We're not really set up right now to um, be able to manage a lot of native turf planting or native, <laughs> plant, native plantings, um, you know, versus turf grass. And so it's just something that we'll have to consider as we move forward, how are we gonna manage these areas once they're converted? And, and the hope is, you know, hopefully it's only a few years. Once they're established, they, for the most part, kind of maintain themselves. Of course, everything needs maintenance. Um, once once we get it established, I, I would love to be able to put a metric to um, the, the cost of maintenance of these naturalized areas versus turf grass. I put just a little bit of research into that and was not really successful in finding that, but I really think it could be a great way to help sell um, the cost of implementing these types of spaces to say, yes, it's gonna cost money up front to convert, um, but look at what it'll save us in the long run. And, and not only you know economically, but also so what increase our pollinators, you know, plantings for our pollinators, that sort of thing. So we definitely think there are great benefits to it. Um, we are exploring a couple other areas in the city right now for doing this type of conversion. We're looking at trying to acquire a parkway at the um, Woods Golf Course. 
So kind of the northern portion of that um, is being developed right now. And as part of that development, we're trying to acquire 12.1 acres, which um, is adjacent to the south branch or southern branch of the Baird Creek. And so with that, our hope is we can um, convert that, you know, all that old turf from the golf course into native planting to make it more of a nice riparian buffer. So that's a project we are currently looking at also. And even like right now, also working with the Wilder um, Neighborhood Association, they just got a grant for a thousand dollars for native plantings at Wilder Park that we're planning to put around the new playground area, which is like a Laura Ingalls Wilder theme. Um, so somewhat appropriate with, with that. And so again, just kind of using that as sort of a, a learning tool for us as we convert from turf to, you know, native type of planting to, to see what goes into that, even a small project like that. Um, so yeah, we're definitely on board. I think figuring out budget and maintenance is gonna be our biggest obstacle as we move forward, so. Yeah, I guess that's all I have, unless anybody has any questions or anything. Then I make a motion that we uh, refer this to staff to uh, look into getting grants and uh, working with outside groups to restore whatever areas we can get restored. There's Second. that motion by Randy. I wanna, make, I wanna make sure I have that um, before we completely move on. Um, motion to refer to staff and apply for grants. Grants. Um, to work, work with outside groups to restore areas along the East River. Okay. Did I miss anything, anyone? Julia, you went off mute. I did. I don't know if it's, do we have discussion before we, uh, is it time for that? <laughs> yeah, we had a first by Randy, second by Ned. So discussion before a vote. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, re you know, recognize what Corey was talking about with thinking about long-term with maintenance. And and do you have then, do you, is Parks, are you, have do you have a way that you're prioritizing which areas you're working at? Because, you know, it's not like we want to just like butt into whatever your planning thing is too. You know, we don't want to direct something that's, you know, giving kind of trying to cut shortcut stuff. We don't want to make, you know, the workload bigger when you already have what your plan. Yeah, I'll just stop. I think you understand what I'm trying to say. I, I guess with that, I would say right now for the parks department, our priority in that area of the city is the flooding along the trail and trying to mitigate um, along with potential stormwater management that comes along with that. And knowing, you know, that that for us is a priority right now. Um, and I, I think you don't necessarily want to put in a nice native planting, knowing that all of a sudden it's gonna to have to be torn up because we gotta implement the right kind of sub base to capture the storm water, to clean it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I definitely think we wanna keep it on our radar and it's an area we're exploring, um, but as far as kind of that prioritization right now for us, it's, I think the trail flooding, um, but not to say that, that the planting can't go along with it as we're exploring that. So <laughs> I guess that's the best way I can answer that. And I know the trail flooding has come to committee and that was looked at and we tried to, uh, uh, I think we gave staff a directive to try and get coordinated with other municipalities. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of sense just to work on ours and, and then uh, the rest of the other part flooded out and uh, I don't really and we know. have been, uh, hang on. Randy, I was just going to say, I've been involved with the East River Resiliency Collaborative um, 
which is a partnership between the Nature Conservancy and a lot of different villages and municipalities and other stakeholders. So that is, there is action being um, taken and momentum uh, along that front. Great, further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, we will uh, call a vote. All those in favor of uh, said motion, say aye. 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 Who was the one that seconded Randy's motion? Ned. Could, could you read back? I, we, have, we do have the member of the media that was <laughs> interested in this item. If we could just reread the motion so she can catch that, I think that'd be nice. Motion to refer to staff and apply for grants to work with outside groups to restore areas along the East River. All right, so that's the motion. We had everybody uh, signify their eyes. Were there any nay votes? Hearing none, that passes. All right. Um, thanks, uh, everybody. Uh, on to item two, discussion with possible action to implement a no mow may policy that was brought forward by uh, Alder Scannell. Uh, Randy, I'll let you take that away. Okay. Um, I, I know, I, I'm bringing this back because of discussions I've had with uh, people in the community and on Facebook, it, there really seems to be a lot of people who would like to do this. And I started thinking, you know, it, I don't know if it's very helpful or not, but I, it's, I think if we can get people engaged in green behaviors, it, that's a good thing. And, um, in the, and with redoing our, our ordinances now and the idea of um, uh, native gardens and, and registering those, I thought perhaps we could piggyback on that. And if anybody wants to do it, they would uh, register. They would again, you know, let uh, with P, uh, DPW register that they wanted to do it and they'd signed an agreement that, you know, uh, after, you know, a week after, by one week after uh, May, that it would be, they'd mow it. And if not, they would pay a hundred dollar fine or whatever Grenier thinks is appropriate. And if necessary, uh, DPW could then farm out that work so they're not overworked because that was part of the part of the equation there of, of why DPW was thinking this really wasn't all that helpful. So uh, I just wanted some bring it back, kick it around, see what you think. I'm, I, and I'm wondering, do we want to encourage people to not mow their lawn or would we rather encourage them to get rid of the lawn and put a native garden? Is that maybe uh, something we'd rather emphasize? Yeah, there you go. Instead of no mow may, if people say, uh, you know, I want to let my grass grow to help the pollinators say, well, you know, get rid of the grass, <laughs> go, go native. So that's a, I, I wanted to bring that up too, to see, you know, uh, I'm not sure I want to do this or not, uh, depending upon our discussion here, but I think there's a few things. I think we should, the more we can get people engaged in green behaviors, the better. And so what's the best way to do that? Um, I'm open to whatever. But I think if we do decide to go with no mow may, I think if we make it uh, part of being registered, uh, like the native gardens, I think uh, DPW would be all right with that, I think. Uh, we can, it'll have to go there. We'll have to have that discussion. But I, I think it makes it more possible anyway. Mm -hmm. so. um like to have, I have a couple of things that I'd like to say before it opens up to the board. Um, so I did review the minutes and I had a conversation with Steve also, because this was brought up last April um, to INS. And, um, you know, as it, as it stands right now, um, in general, I would say the feelings have not changed. The, the, you know, the, the rationale that was presented last year at this time hasn't changed as far as um, what the overall benefit to a NOMO may, may, may really provide for pollinators. Um, in, the, in our current ordinance, it allows for eight inches. Um, which in some cases may be enough to allow for some of those early season flowers. Um, 
And then the, you know, the, the long grass complaints, I mean, that is a reality. That's, that's a reality that, that DPW faces every year. Um, so that's something we need to bear in mind if, if we go down this, if the committee goes down this path. Um, you know, I did ask for some information on what the complaints have looked like over the last few years. And in 2019, just in, and these are just May statistics, um, 115 long grass complaints. Um, in May of 2020, there was 72 complaints in the month of May. And then so far this month, we have 38 complaints for long grass. Um, and what that translates into is a, in 2019, about 25% of those properties of those 115, the city responds to and had to ultimately go out and, and cut the grass in those at those properties. Um, there's a whole process involved, but basically when the city receives a complaint of long grass, they respond within a day, two days at the max. They have to go out to that property and do a site evaluation. And then they, you know, and then the property owner is given some time to, to cut the grass. Um, so I guess what this means is if we go the Nomo May route, um, it will definitely increase that complaint process. Um, and the resources are already stretched pretty thin in regards to that. Um, There was also a couple of experts, I guess, local experts that were consulted last year. Um, and Steve brought that forward um, in the meeting last year about the, you know, the, the potential benefits of, of Nomo May. And really, I guess the conclusion was if someone's letting their grass grow long, but they're still er treating it with potential, you know, with herbicides to treat dandelions, now we just have really, we have long grasses and not a lot of fl um, flowers that are, that are available. Um, and I also agree with, with you, Randy. Um, I think we need to promote the, the planned natural landscape areas and encourage registration and really do a good job of getting the word out there so that, you know, if people want to do pollinator habitat, that it's, it's maybe a long-term sustainable thing than just one month, you're not mowing your grass versus a whole section of your yard that's dedicated to pollinators. So my recommendation is to go that route. All right, thanks, Melissa. Ned, you have your hand up? I do. Um, can we, okay, so, um the long grass uh isn't it that nine inches wasn't that the, the level um where is that laid out because i i thought it used to be nine inches for um what was allowed to grow unmanaged in the city i think with the revision i was just looking at the the noxious weeds and maintenance of vegetation revision and it went from nine inches to eight inches oh Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I think, you know, we brought this up last year and, and kind of arrived at the same question. Should we promote no mo may or should we really be advocating for permanent pollinator plantings? Um, uh, I think that maybe there could be some kind of a compromise uh, by mid-May maybe to allow, I mean, um, this year it would have made a difference right last year it probably wouldn't have depends on the weather kind of uh how much is actually blooming by may um i think there's enough lawn violets and, and dandelions this year that would have made a pretty big difference this year um so uh i think the the initial impetus came out of the pollinator corridor working group and and we kind of pitched it to the city as could we do this with city properties? The answer to that was no, because it would gum up the lawnmowers and the machinery used um, on the city properties. And that the city would take the position of identifying areas 
owned by the city to convert from turf into pollinator habitat. Now, immediately after that conversation that we had with Steve, COVID hit, everything kind of ground to a halt. The elections came about. Um, so I do think we need to get back on the on the horse looking for city land that we can convert from turf into pollinators uh, habitat. As far as allowing private residents to do it, I think we could refer that idea to INS again, or wherever, protection policy, um, probably not there, okay, um, INS, INS, and then have a public kind of, you know, a publicly attended meeting to hear what people have to say about that, and let the folks on INS make a recommendation. That would be that would be what I think we should do as a committee. I'll make a motion eventually if if needed, but I think Julia has her hand up too. Yeah, Julia, go ahead. Um, yeah, I really that was good comments, Ned. <laughs> um, and it, Randy, I so agree with what you said about I see where you're coming from from if people are specifically excited about it too uh, so that is challenging I just I the people last year I, and I, it's not like I'm against I feel silly I'm, I wouldn't say I'm like against the note mome but I just find it kind of silly because it's not like just if just from my own experience I mow there's still dandelions and stuff ever literally everywhere but you look at my next door neighbor who sprays and it's bare so like that to me is like a much bigger issue it should be no spray may maybe <laughs> like, uh, I think um but so there's that and then if you if I let we let our grass grow through May we with you could not mow it with our normal lawnmower either I just don't even understand how that would be possible so I think that causes like a whole bunch of other issues. Um, so I, and then also my last thing is from a stormwater perspective, um, healthy lawns soak up more water rather than running off. And uh, the best practices for lawn maintenance to have a healthy lawn with like root systems is to mow frequently actually. Um, and at keep it, mow with like three inches, three and a half inches or something and mow it frequently. And at the beginning, so it encourages uh, root growth and you have a healthy lawn that can like absorb a lot of water. So it's actually the opposite of like stormwater management for a healthy lawns too. And weeds. All right, Corey. Yes, yeah, so um, I guess kind of Touching on what Julia said, my at last, so my understanding is the recommendation for mowing turf is you don't want to take off more than one third of the leaf frame um, for the health of the turf itself. And so, yes, I think, you know, to let it grow super long and then cut it down to that three inches isn't necessarily great for turf grass. Um, I did too, and I, I can't remember the source or the article, but I did just recently read an article actually that explored the idea of no mow. And article what it said that actually mowing every two weeks was more beneficial um, in providing flowers for pollinators than letting you grow for like say all of May, which I thought was interesting. Um, not sure how much research has been done on that, um, but just thought it was worth mentioning. Um, but I do have to say I am in favor of the no mow may. I think, um, so I live in the city of De Pere and they are allowing no mow may this year. Um, they also are um, providing like a sign you can put in your yard that says like no mow may and it has a B on it. So people can understand, you know, what you're trying to achieve by letting it grow. Um, it, you're not required to that sort, but it's something we could explore if we wanted to move forward with it. Um, I do think though, I like the idea and I think kind of what Alder Scano was touching on is for me, I think it's 
it's too about teaching people to maybe change their perception about what your a homeowner's yard needs to look like. And do we need that perfectly green manicured lawn? In my opinion, I don't think so. <laughs> I, um, but, you know, a lot of people in my family and that I talk to prefer to have that perfectly green manicured lawn. And I think it's mainly because of perception and and, and really that's it. That's what they're comfortable with. Um, so I think just kind of stepping outside the box by allowing something like this maybe is a way to start changing people's perception about that. Um, and I definitely like the idea of encouraging the planned natural landscapes. I just think the average homeowner doesn't know how to maintain them. So many will be afraid to implement them because they don't know what to do with them. Um, <laughs> Can we give them tools to teach them how to take care of them? Yes, I think that would be great. But um, yeah, I don't know. I'm in favor of it. So I think any way we can get it to happen would be great. And maybe having some sort of signage or other registration of it to help alleviate concerns would be a good way of achieving that. Thanks, Corey. Mark and then Julia. <clears throat> Yeah, and actually, Corey's uh, comments were right in line with what I was thinking um, of educating the public on normal May. It, it may not benefit the pollinators. It may or may not, you know, depending on the season every year, but at least getting that idea into play that you don't have to mow your lawn right away. You don't have to have this super green, um, over fertilized piece of property in your front yard or backyard. Um, and I think it also sends an additional message. I mean, Appleton's been doing this for a couple of years now. De Pere is now doing it. Uh, if you're comparing successes, Appleton and Green Bay would be more comparable in terms of how many complaints they may get on yard issues, on grass length, things like that. Um, and I think it, it it's more of an educational component than it is a, a, a pollinator, a specific pollinator benefit, but it may get people to think longer about mowing down um their yards when the lovely dandelions do come up i mean i'm i'm a huge fan of dandelions i love it uh, my neighbor one side of my street is dandelions one side of my street is not a dandelion to be seen so my dog and i walk one side and not the other um just but she's fertilizing the lawns anyway so uh, but yeah i i i guess from the, just the standpoint of broader education, I think a NOMO may has merit in those terms um, on a regular basis for the city. Uh, I, as I'm thinking about it, I, uh, I guess I'm not I'm not necessarily opposed to NOMO may. I, I still want uh, more effort uh, in promotion of pollinator areas. Um, I think we need to, to get more education out there for uh, city residents. But, you know, I, I liked what Corey was saying in what De Pere is doing in terms of the signage. I'm wondering if anybody has, has taken a look at what the cost of the complaints for long grass are um, versus what the cost of perhaps that signage would be. So if, if we've got people identifying their lawns as a no mo may lawn, perhaps that reduces some of those complaints as well. It, it maybe does both, it takes care of the pollinators and maybe reduces the cost of the complaints because they've self-identified as no mo may. Just a thought. All right, thanks, John. Other thoughts? Just, Randy? Yeah, I just want to reiterate, I think for me, the difference from last year to this year is the idea of you know registering the, the um, native gardens. I think some kind of registration process with signage, I like the idea of signage too, uh, is the difference here. I think that should help because if, if people have registered and a complaint comes in, I mean, we talked about this for the native gardens, you know, people are going to complain about the hose and DPW with that registration is, uh, it can handle it. So I think I, I would look at this as being the same kind of process, same kind of thing. 
Um, I think it, if we push this forward, um, registration and, and signage, actually really nice, uh, would, should definitely be a part of it. I, I think, I don't, I don't think without it, I'm not sure we'd get DPW's buy-in, but I think with it, I, I don't see, um, I think there's a, you know, Steve should be more amendable to that if we're, if we're helping him, <laughs> if we're not giving him a headache, uh, uh, I think it, it, it makes it uh, more doable. So, uh, and I, you know, like I said, I wasn't sure if I wanted to support this or not either. I just wanted to have the discussion and, and with all the new details and everything. And I, I really like the idea of pushing native gardens. I didn't, I didn't know you had to take care of them. I don't take care of mine. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, so I, I, I guess, um, I, I guess I would like to, uh, uh, push this on to INS that, that, that the committee, that this commission would, uh, um, well, I'll make a motion that um, uh, we refer this to INS with the, uh, uh, how, would I, how would it work? That uh, people clear their lawns for no mow me. Can you repeat that, Randy? That refer to INS that people can register their lawns for no mow me. Okay. Do we want to say anything like adopt a resolution or you know for no mow me? You know, including registration. I, I don't know how specific we need to get in the motion. I don't. I don't know if it'd be a resolution. It would be part of the. Uh, it'd become part of our ordinance then, wouldn't it? Or, or part of uh, DPW policy. Could we say that we we uh, refer to INS to establish a policy for allowing no uh, you know, lawns to be part of a no mow may program? Program, sure, that sounds good. To refer refer to INS committee to establish a policy to allow for individuals to be to participate in a no mow may program could we um anyway i would like to amend it just slightly when when we get to that point well we haven't made the motion yet Why, what, what would you like to see yeah we're, we're we're kind yeah. of workshopping this right now so <laughs> okay. the other thing that i just want to ask as a part of discussion is is the pollinator work group willing to be a part of the work involved with promoting this um, and I guess community outreach and some of those other aspects of if this goes through really being a part of the whole process. Is there capacity in the, in the pollinator work group to help support this? Yeah, I think we need to. I, I, I would agree that it should be something that the working group takes on. Um, along with what John is doing, maybe out at GB as well. Um, and he's connected to some of the folks that are also in the working group too. So um, with with GB's B, B program, um, I think I think John and I maybe should should set up some time to, to talk about how we can effectively work together to promote this with our separate working groups. <laughs> mm -hmm. Before INS, so that you can come to INS. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I would ask from, from as a staff person that, you know, when this, if this gets approved and it goes to INS, that there's good representation from the Sustainability Commission at that meeting. Um, I guess that's what I wanted to say. Well, how did you want to amend it, Ned? I, I thought Julia had a really important twist on this and not just calling it a no, no mome frame. And that way it could be kind of our own unique twist on, on that. And also push the message a little further that it's not just about cutting, it's also about what do you apply mm -hmm. to your space. And also to make it clear that we're not recommending that the city not cut. City. 
because that's not going to go anywhere with Steve and his crew. <laughs> right, 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 right. This would be for property owners. Yeah. And, and the thing, I, the thing that would be weird about, I like the idea of messaging with the no spray, but there is no anybody can spray or not. You know, it wouldn't. It's, there's no policy, city policy on that. So I don't know how that would look. I mean, if there's a policy, it would make sense. Oh, to, it's no. just volunteering, you know, we're not mowing, we're not spraying. Sorry, Melissa, I cut you off. Well, I wanted to add, and, and please don't quote me on this, but um, I heard from the parks director, Dan Ditchite, last week. I was looking for different types of sustainability things that the different departments have implemented over the last couple of years. And one comment that he said was the parks, um, has they have stopped using pesticides. Um, I don't know if that was other than for ball fields, other than for turf grass maintenance in ball fields, they have stopped spraying. So maybe it wasn't a, a big policy. I, I, I don't know, but that I do have um, record of that. Yeah, I'm not sure if anybody else, I don't know if any other department sprays. I don't think DPW does. I could be wrong. It could be like depending like if there are certain facilities that a department has that they need to maintain clearance, they might use spraying. Um, you know, utilities routinely do that. So I, I'm not really sure. Yeah, I'm not opposed to adding that to the uh, to the uh, communication, but it, it does it does come across. I think the city has a. Uh, we're talking about property owners. We don't have any kind of policy or ordinance prohibiting or mm -hmm. directing that behavior. So maybe we should start looking at, you know, do we want an ordinance of no, <laughs> no spraying? Do we um, do we want to well, um, have it be so that it's it's limited to Green Bay residential properties? Um, you know, versus commercial properties or vacant lands and things property, like that. Private I think private property. Yeah. So if there's a business that wants to do it, I, I don't think you know. I think that just private property. We're, 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 this is the focus is uh, for private property. Yeah, and I think it would be hard to. I, I think it would be a bigger benefit in some ways to have, have a private. You know, think about the paper mills where they they have set aside land that they they spend hours mowing all the time. That would be great for uh, a no mow may experiment and and demonstration project. Um, just in terms of the comment though about the no spray, I, I, would, I would love it. Um, you know, on a personal level, I have a breed of dog that is highly susceptible to uh, yard uh, pesticides and herbicides. Scottish Terriers die more than any other breed because of, uh, and there's a clear connection between yard chemicals and, uh, and tumors that they get in their bladder. So I'm adamantly against spraying stuff and I always look at my neighbor's lawns when I walk with her. But um, I think it would be difficult to, to enforce and even police in some manner, just because how do you identify a lawn that hasn't been, that has not been sprayed? It's easy enough to identify the ones that have been sprayed, but how do you, you know, the, the absence of it is, is, a, is a tough call. All. While you could make, you know, suggest that people don't don't spray during May as well, um, I would rather us get the no mow May part down and then approach the other because you're also, I suspect, going to get pushback from the the yard companies on, you know, if you're saying, oh, we're not going to tell people not to spray during May. Okay, they're go through any neighborhood in May and they're it's one of their busiest times of year where they're fertilizing and spraying and doing all sorts of other things this time of year. So um, rather than getting, you know, not having, uh, a, not getting a no mow may policy put in place because we're combining it with a no spray policy, rather get the no mow may policy set, put in place, get people used to that idea and then start talking further or immediately after that, start talking about, you know, not spraying as well as part of a larger, um, larger effort. So. I think that's a fair point. I can remove my amendment idea for a, for a later conversation. 
but I do like it, Julia. I think no spray is is something that we should be promoting, whether a yard our company gets mad at us or not. There's a there are cities and that have stuff citywide policies for city properties that have stuff too. So that could be something to start with here and look at. When I, I think the, park, the parks this, already did it, so you know yeah. it could be just extending it to all city properties or something. Yeah, I think all the school districts have pretty well enacted that kind of policy too, haven't they? I hope so. That's yeah. that would be good. <laughs> would be an important one. <laughs> Great. Well, so the main motion then, which was by Randy or or Mark, can can we get the motion repeated and can we get a second? But Mark, go ahead. How about Melissa? Were you, weren't you typing it up as we were going along? Because I've gotten lost in this swallow and then <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Okay. Refer to INS committee to establish a policy to allow Green Bay residents to participate in no mome. I would say voluntarily participate. That's the motion okay. and that was by Mark. I'll second. Uh, second by Randy. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, on to committee. Thanks everybody. Well, before we leave this though, can I just ask that we, to come back to Ned and Julia's points about a no spray thing, can we, uh, make sure that we get that onto an agenda sometime in the future so that we don't leave it behind for too long? Actually, I'd like to have a, an even broader one. Could we do in a, could we look at uh, all the types of pollution residents are, you know, create and, and start working on ways to mitigate that? I mean, how do, how do homeowners uh, pollute every which way, carbon footprint, everything, and what can uh, residents start doing to, to uh, mitigate their pollution? I mean, that, I, and I would think that would include spraying and, and hopefully a lot more. So noted. Um, I, I think we might, for future discussions, want to, to narrow that a little bit, Randy. Otherwise, we could uh, be here a really long time. But I think uh, we'll make sure the note, <laughs> yeah, no well. spray June uh, or July or whatever uh, uh, discussion gets added to a future month. All right, moving on then to Resilinator update uh, under information. Okay. All right. So for my updates, um, let me just get my notebook. Uh, the latest update on the, the green infrastructure code audit project is that the chapter 13, which deals with landscaping standards in the zoning code, um, those are all, all five, there's five separate areas of that code that have been looked at and amended. Um, it's you know gone through various levels of, of lots of different staff input. Um, Corey was very involved with that as well. And um, it's gone through law review. So we are at the point now where we have, we are going to do public outreach for chapter 13 um, before it goes to committee. Um, it cannot go to committee until the, the municipal code, the entire code gets recodified. So it's, um, it, it's gonna kind of wait and it gives us time then to do some public input, public outreach sessions for the chapter 13. Um, chapter 30, which deals with the stormwater, the stormwater code updates, that is still in progress. Um, I made quite a bit of headway this week on it so far with, with some staff in my department. So the plan going forward is 
to wrap up the amendments to chapter 30 and then bundle those together, send them off. We're gonna do a joint public input session for both chapter 30 and chapter 13 for the green infrastructure amendments. And, um, and after that, they'll go to, each of those chapters will go to the respective committees. And then we will um, present those to council as one package. Um, it, it saves on staff time. Um, it also, um, you know, it's all part of the same project. So I think just messaging it like that will avoid confusion for people thinking like, well, didn't we already hear a presentation on this? So um, that's that's my plan that I'm recommending. And it's been shared with, with senior staff to go that route as well. Um, and then also just having more talks um, in regards to the the American the recovery the funds that are that are coming towards the uh, city of Green Bay on potential projects to pursue for green infrastructure. Um, so having discussions with with staff and the mayor on that. Um, and then also drafting some of the component the components for the flood resiliency plan. Um, what else? Um, we're also putting together some survey questions for uh, residents in the East River area for neighborhood outreach, which will help guide some of the resiliency planning efforts as well. I guess those are the main the main things. Any questions? I have a question. Um, do you know how far along the process is for registering yes. natural landscapes? Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. So yeah. um, the process, <laughs> <laughs> it's just what, I mean, there's like a thousand updates, Ned. It's just, so that one um, I've been working, Steve, <laughs> um, primarily myself, but Steve also, and I have been working with Shelby for an online registration form um, okay. that will guide residents through the process. Um, so we have sort of a beta version right now ready. Um, Steve is putting together a sample plan so that we can have a PDF of, a, of you know, what a, an example of a sample plan would look like that, that so that when people go on to the, the city's website and they want to know, you know, how do I register my natural landscape? They can see, you know, these are the different components, you know, a site drawing, um, a list of plant species and whatnot. And right now we've, I'd say we're probably about 90% there. Um, the goal was to have it ready to go by June 1st. So I think we're still on track for that. Um, we also wanna make sure that we have just regular downloadable PDF forms that people can print off and do it the old fashioned way if that's the way they would like to do it. Um, but I think this will really streamline the process and it'll alert staff when, when we have a registered landscape that's been received through that portal. Okay. So the, there's folks from the pollinator corridor working group that are, are interested in that. And this might be a service they could provide is looking at a draft or just giving feedback on, on the beta form um, just as an idea. Um, I'm not saying that you have to, but. Well, I mean, it's primarily kind of an IT thing, you know, the, the form. It's it's not like, um, doesn't have pictures of plants on it or anything like that. I, I'm not saying yeah. it's like super pretty. Um, and I, I think the question is, you know, we ideally, or, you know, logistically, it should be housed somewhere within the DPW section of the website, but people might not know, not know to go there and um, so, you know, that's just kind of a logistical thing that I'm that I'm kind of toying with is where's the best place to put it? Where's the best so that people know to find it? Because honestly, I'm sure, you know, everyone would love, every department would love their, their stuff to be front page news on the city's website. Um, so that's, that's kind of an internal question so that sure. people know where to go. Right, could it be linked to our sustainability page as well? 
it could, kind of yeah, it, it definitely could be, you know, we could, I, I'm thinking we could probably have multiple ways of getting there. Um, but again, it's not necessarily as clear as day. Yeah. When you go to the city's website, where to find everything. Sure. Um, an idea that I've been toying around, this is kind of, you know, broadening the question a little, you know, answering your question a little bit. But one thing that I would really like the city to do is to have just a dedicated area for sustainability things that the city's doing. Not necessarily just the sustainability committee, but different efforts and different projects that the city has done. Um, so it's not just this is our committee and this is where everything lies, you know, because it's there's there's really great things that, that are happening out there. It's just that we don't really have like one consolidated way of showcasing those efforts. Okay. So yeah, I like that idea. That's just kind of my, in the back of my mind I, I, where I'd like to see things go. Um, so we will need help promoting this. We will need help um, getting it through different channels in the community so that people are aware of it. And hopefully it spurs more interest in doing this. Um, we'd also like to link resources, local resources, you know, if someone's interested in creating a natural landscape, but maybe they don't know where to start, um, you know, people not necessarily like, you know, to pay for a plan, but just, you know, maybe volunteer services that are that are out there for people to tap into. Yeah, um, if, if you think, well, maybe you and I can talk later. Let's, yeah, yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Were there any other questions? I was just wondering for the landscape ordinance update, are you, who, when you say you're doing outreach, is that to developers or who are you doing outreach to? Yeah, that, that will, that will be the, some of the stakeholders that will, that the city will be in, um, contacting and inviting um, local landscapers, contractors, um, builders, um, those will be the primary, you know, because the people that are doing construction in many cases also have to do stormwater plans. So it's, that's why the idea was to, um, to combine a virtual Q and A listening session, input session for both those chapters. Does that include like sub people, developers who do subdivisions or is it more of the commercial park, anyone who has a parking lot kind of thing? I don't know that level of detail yet. I'm leaning okay. on community and economic development to assist with that process. Right. Last call. Hearing no other questions, we'll move on to uh, committee updates. Thank you, uh, Melissa. Go ahead, John. Uh, I'll just report out on the uh, Clean Energy Work Group, our, our most recent meeting. Um, you know, our starting point has been the uh, city's commitment to be carbon neutral by 2050. And we've started looking at a few areas. One was with our carbon footprint, uh, that's sort of a, a starting point. But we're also starting to look at, okay, what's the next step? And ultimately, if we're going to, to reach carbon neutrality by 2050 or earlier, we need to develop a plan. And we're starting to look at uh, several uh, Wisconsin communities that actually have climate action plans. Uh, we want to, we're starting to review those to determine a couple of things. First of all, what is the uh, makeup of uh, typical steering committees that are involved in, in developing these plans for, for a community? Um, we're looking at the plans themselves to find sort of the common elements the things that we need to consider for Green Bay. We're also trying to look at just 
the general time frame? What's involved in in terms of time uh, to achieve a carbon uh, a climate action plan for the community? So uh, we're going to take the next couple of months and, and sort of dig in a little deeper to see if we want to move on to the next step or we want to develop a plan. Uh, what really is required to, to to make this happen? So that that was the most recent discussion. All right, thank you, John. Other updates or questions for John? All righty then, hearing none, we'll move on to item three of informational, the Trex Plastic Film Recycling Challenge update. Corey, would you like to give an update or, or, sure. or would you, or, <laughs> yeah. or I can, I wasn't sure if you were still out there. Yep, I'm here. Um, yeah, so we have the materials, which are basically um, some recycle containers and then signs to go along with them. We're planning to start collecting the plastic, although actually it sounds like some people are, um, are since we put something on social media, they're already bringing things into like the wildlife sanctuary, <laughs> but we're going to officially start um, June 1st and have we'll have two um, collection bins there, one at the nature center, one at the observation building. Um, and then we're also going to have a bin at the, at city hall. Um, we kind of initially talked about placing it inside, but then we also talked about how it might be a um, maybe not as convenient for folks to do it that way because with the parking meters there and that type of thing we're trying to um, probably do an outside location there just to make it as simple as possible for people. And so we'll be getting, um, we'll be collecting and just, well, I, I think I already shared that we're going to take the materials that we collect, we're going to get them weighed at the Brown County facility, and then we're, it, they'll end up going to Festival Foods, which will then ship them off to the recycling center. So um, we'll see how it goes. Hopefully we get what we need so we can get that bench and kind of keep promoting it. And I think, um, you know, if it's successful, we definitely are open to to seeing about maintaining that um, program and then also to possibly expand it. So yeah, that's about it, unless anybody has questions. No, I just Corey, add, is there, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say, go ahead, Norv, go ahead, Ned. It's okay, you can call <laughs> me whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I um, tried to try to do some of this at the school, um, ran into the issue of the fact that the plastic is, is usually contaminated with food um, when my students bring it in. So, um, really striking out there unfortunately but if there is something like a, a press note um, that I could share with the district about this uh, at least we could get that information out to you know several thousand families um, in the district by a media blast okay. yeah. and, and I would like to say uh, um, I'd probably add you know Corey and I just uh, basically had a correspondence today just in terms of setting up logistics which we haven't put into place yet so um we want to make sure we've got everything in place before we start taking everything because um otherwise i think the city's drop sites the initial rush is going to overwhelm them and i don't have a place yet to put them in my facility i i have places but i want to make sure that it's clean and and dry and out of the way so that we're not storing a lot um, outside um, so give me a week to get things organized and then we'll be ready, fully ready to go on our end as well. And, and the logistics will be in place to get things taken care of. Um, yeah, school district, not a great option for plastic collection, so. Yeah, and I think with that um, too, just to note, which I think I've, talked about previously too is that the parks department does want to work on really promoting this and you know through social media and that type of thing so you know Ned if 
maybe touching base with you to see the best way of taking our information to get it into the school district then they're you know passing it along um, might be useful so yes we're definitely interested in in spreading the word so <clears throat> and we're interested in expanding it like i said earlier to the, the county as a whole at some point in the future um you know, working since De Pere already has a program and and from uh, Scott Thoris and their public work structure basically said they're as soon as they get their bench enough for their first bench they re-enroll in the program get another one they're on their third working towards their third bench already and that was news to us um, that the program allowed for an ongoing effort like that but uh, from the county standpoint I talked to our county exec and he's like he's he's on board so we should be able to go with something countywide at some point in the future Troy's in the bag It's not going in there at the end, Randy. Good for you. Well, I also wanted to let you know, I appreciate you bringing your item forward, but I got to tell you that subject of uh, floodplain remediation, I find it all wet. Are we moving to adjourn now? Is that? I, mean, I don't know how we can top <laughs> that. So we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. By Elder Andy, second by Mark. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed. Adjourned. All right. Uh, have a have a good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Good night. <laughs>